What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell, and we are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. All right, thanks for being with us. We appreciate you being a part of the show. As you've come to expect from us here on IC, the Coast to Coast podcast is your stop for breaking news or just general discussion about North Carolina basketball, what's going on with recruiting, the Tar Heel program in general, et cetera, et cetera. With me, as always, the two gentlemen who make the show what it is, what it was, and what it ever will be. Shout out to Bret Hart. Uh, guys, how are you doing? Sean, what's up, man? What's good on the West Coast there? You good? Awesome. Cool. Sherelle, you doing all right? Yes, you've got your technological difficulties squared away. Um, so I think the first thing we want to talk about is there's been a little movement around North Carolina, but just not what I think our subscribers and the fans in general are looking for. But out of nowhere, and what I mean is like this is just full on RKO stuff. Brady Dunlap, six foot seven, small forward out of Harvard Westlake. Uh, most folks folks may have know him from the guy on the wing, Darren Bronny's games. Sherelle, how did we discover this Brady Dunlap? Uh, offer and and you got some quotes from the kid where did this come from so i'm looking i got my phone out because i'm looking so i'll make sure that i'm 100 percent accurate um but basically <laughs> on i think was it tuesday night wednesday night it it all you know kind of runs together uh but i was chatting with ben you know via slack ben sherman you know editor-in-chief of ic and uh, we were like, okay, you know, we've got this to look for tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, all right, talk to you tomorrow. And then about 20 minutes later, he sent me a text. And I was trying to find the reporter's name because I, I wanted to give that reporter full credit. But he sent me a text and it was like, North Carolina just offered Brady Dunlap, you know, a sharpshooter <laughs> out of Harvard or West, Westlake. Uh, Jack Poland is his name. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what? Who? When? How? Where? Why? <laughs> um, so it was just a matter of trying to track all that down to get the information. Um, Braden Jenkins, who's really good, a national recruiting analyst for 27 Sports, has a good relationship with Brady, was able to talk to him. Uh, but yeah, it just, for us, it came out of nowhere. Usually, if Carolina is talking to a kid or if they're interested in it, we, we kind of at least get a little wind of it, even if we don't think it's at an offer level. We kind of know that there's some interest. But this one, honestly, just did not see coming. And so it was our job over the next couple of hours to try to get quotes from him, which we were able to, thanks to Brandon, to, to put the, a story together and just, just learn more about him and where his recruitment stands from a UNC perspective. How? I, I think that that's the biggest thing a lot of a lot of folks that are tuning in this pod will, will be asking is, how does this happen? You know, again, you've mentioned that that North Carolina staff has been a little more um, a little more undercover recently, uh, but how does, how does a, a guy all the way on the West Coast get an offer uh, and and nobody knows about it. I just that seems so odd. And and again, kudos to you guys and Brandon for for putting that together. But how does this come out of the blue and and nobody's even got a, a sniff of it? That I know I've known you for a long time, dude. I've never seen this before. I don't think. Yeah, I I think it's just when both parties are willing to kind of keep things under wraps. That's when you get these kind of surprises. So uh, as I've said, and, and really, it's not even new. But under really dating back to Roy Williams arriving at UNC. You know, he's not a big fan of what he used to call the crap net. The crap net. Uh, yeah. So really dating back to then, um, UNC's uh, relationship with the media, especially those who cover recruiting, has been um, definitely kind of hands off, uh, very at a distance. And so, uh, you know, they're just kind of operating how they always have. What you add is now with the portal kids and with Dunlap, if they don't want to talk, then it's really, really difficult to kind of figure out you know, how you get the information about who's re re recruiting whom and who's offered whom and, and all those good things. So, uh, yeah, just just out of nowhere. That's just kind of where things are. But luckily enough, we were able to talk to him. Uh, he says he's scheduled an official visit for UNC later this month. In a couple of weeks, I think he's supposed to arrive um, on the 30th, which <clears throat> we'll get into it. But the next two weekends after this one are live periods for non-scholastic events, uh, a.k.a. AAU. Uh, so the UNC staff will be out and about. So I guess that's why the visit um, is currently scheduled. What Dunlap said is for April 30th. Sean, tell us a little bit about this kid's game. I mean, it's, again, you see 6-7. What film that, that is out there, to, to my untrained eye, looks like a much better fluid shooter, at least a catch-and-shoot kid. But I want you to give us the, the lowdown as, as what you see watching him and, and what should excite folks 
uh, and kind of make them think, all right, this is why Hubert Davis' staff offered this good a scholarship. Well, no, no, normally I'm, I'd be getting extremely excited about somebody in, in the LA area getting an offer. Usually it would be uh, well before they finish their, their senior year. But in terms of, of Dunlap, I mean, this year in, in LA, there was, uh, you know, or I guess over the last four or five years, high school basketball has been pretty big in the area. Uh, but this year, between Harvard Westlake, uh, Sierra Canyon, and then Notre Dame, uh, which is where Zaire Williams went several years ago, those were really the big three. So anytime they were matched up, uh, you know, there was a lo- large following. Not a, not like when you know the balls were playing at Chino Hill, but but similar. Uh, Poly Pavilion hosted a few games, etc. So. Harvard West, like they won, they're the best team. They, they lost two games all year. They won the championship. Uh, uh, Dunlap was, you know, the best or one of the best players on that, that team, but he put up, uh, you know, 14 points playing in Nike EYBL. It wasn't a huge sample size, but he played, um, uh, I think 11 games, uh, several of that being in the peach jam. So he put up 14 points, 35% from three. Uh, similar stats playing in, in high school with a talented team, 17 points, five rebounds. And then when you add the fact that there's not a lot of uncommitted guys in the current class, uh, I, I think it, it makes sense, you know, looking at it, looking at it right now, but in terms of his game, uh, tall, skinny, sharp shooter can, uh, you know, can move a little bit off the dribble in terms of, of get, you know, one dribble, two dribble pull-ups. Uh, I think in high school could get to the, get to the basket, but, uh, I think the, the strength and athleticism would, would definitely be an issue year one, but you look where he committed. I mean, you look at the ranking in the, in the one hundreds, that's not going to get anybody excited, especially given the difficulties that really any recruit, uh, 51 through a hundred traditionally has as a freshman, uh, in probably 70 to 80% of the cases. But you can kind of see the ranking history. It's been in the 70s before a drop into the 100s. But he's played highest level in California, um, highest level in, in AAU, and and done well. And then you look at where he was committed to Notre Dame and Mike Bray. And I think Mike Bray has a pretty good eye for talent, especially that fits his his system. And I think if he had stayed at Notre Dame, you know, given everybody they're losing, <laughs> maybe he he probably would have played more than normal, but in a normal Notre Dame year as a freshman, he would probably have been coming off the bench uh, kind of as a seventh, eighth man. And and then he's a guy that is maybe six man as a sophomore or starting, and he's going to give you a, a very strong four-year career and go, go have a heck of a career overseas. Um, so I think you're, you can get an ACC level player with what, what he brings. And once again, he, he brings shooting. So I, I think that's has, has been really the main criteria that the coaching staff has been looking for, whether that's the transfer portal or now 20, you know, 2023. So the fact that he was open, you know, it, it makes sense now, but obviously came as a surprise to, to everybody. Sure. I'm going to ask something that I think a lot of our, uh, our listeners or most of the folks that are asking subscribers have probably asked why Brady Dunlap and is he just a Tyler Nickel replacement, or is this a situation where Hubert Davis is just going after more kids that can shoot? Yeah, I, again, I, I don't think it's complicated. Um, I think, you know, North Carolina was historically deficient from three last year, and they lost uh, pretty much almost the entire bench, not quite. Um, and in Nickel, they did lose a player who they thought would be able to contribute Um you know, as a sophomore, and if he had stayed, definitely, you know, potential starter, really productive as a junior. And so I think it's not a replacement, but you are kind of resetting uh, that idea of, okay, you want a shooter, you want to develop him over a, a couple of years in hopes that, you know, he stays with you, you're, you know, stays with you, he becomes a, a better player developed. And then as a sophomore and junior, you know, he can really do some things because, I do think, uh, you know, just looking at some of his games and talking to people, there are a lot of things to like. Uh, you know, Brandon Jenkins, whose opinion I really respect, is is really high on him. Um, you know, I don't think he'll ever become, like, an NBA all-star or anything, but I do think he's a player who can be really productive um, in college. And you start to look at, again, his he's committed to Notre Dame, which is a, a pretty good school. Um, and then you look at his Final Five, you know, there are some, some teams who have uh, – 
historically, I think, in my opinion, d developed players well. Um, especially Villanova is in his top five. Uh, St. John's under Rick Pitino. You know, Pitino knows what he's doing. So you kind of, if they're interested, you, you kind of say, okay, I, maybe I can see it. Uh, so Penn State, Villanova, UNC, and Nebraska. I named five schools, right? Penn State, UNC, uh, Nebraska, Villanova, and St. John's. Those are his final five. He was at Nebraska uh, this past weekend for an official visit. Uh, and I think he's going to take one more before he goes to UNC. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. The competition is strong. It's not a guarantee just because he's, you know, right now top 50, top 150. As it means, it's just a shoe in for UNC. There are other schools who really want this kid. Because uh, as we've seen in the tournament the last couple of years, you know, shooters who are tall just are, are very important. They don't fall out of trees. So if you can get one, you take it and figure out the rest later. Yeah, I mean, that list you mentioned, that's that's pretty strong. And then you also consider, you know, Rick Patino back in New York. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe he's just enamored with the opportunity for his, you know, his 15 seconds of fame uh, at St. John's. <laughs> um, guys, what about, uh, what about let's reset kind of, I think the thing that everyone's kind of hung on is this weekend. Uh, Sherelle shared here last week. Uh, that is the um, the Harrison Ingram in home visit from UNC staff. Sherelle, do you want to give any sort of uh, intel that you've been able to glean from that? <laughs> uh, no, was, all right. <laughs> it, they would call this like a morsel, is it, you know, uh, it, a, 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 not even a nugget, a tidbit. Yeah, yeah, less less than a tidbit, whatever you know, middle school, minuscule, whatever. Uh, no, I mean, both sides. Uh, you know, talked to people close to both sides who said you know it went well, which is what you would expect everyone to say in that situation and and 99.9% .9 of the time is what people say in that situation. Uh, he hosted, uh, I think Baylor, Texas A&M and Michigan as well for in-home visits over the last few days and is scheduled to go to Kansas for a visit tomorrow, which is a big deal. Um, so we'll see kind of what happens after that. You know, will he schedule a visit to UNC potentially next week or the week after that? We'll see. Um, the timetable, you know, we were told a while ago from a source was not to expect anything, you know, probably before the end of the month. Now, I know what the conventional wisdom says when crystal balls are placed and all that good stuff, um, that it seems to be imminent. I'm not saying that it's not, just saying that the, the word we got from the beginning was that it was more likely to stretch out through the month of April rather than kind of close down in the middle. So we're in the middle. It's not the end. So we'll see uh, where that goes. But yeah, I would just monitor whether or not he decides to uh, take a trip to UNC, whether it's an, on, is an unofficial or an official. Um, if he gets out of the Kansas visit, you know, without committing there and decides to go elsewhere, then you would think that it's still kind of an open race. Um, but the, the Kansas visit does loom large. Appreciate the intel there. I know you feel like it's uh, it's a small bit, but as we've been able to tell over the last couple of weeks, man, our, our subscribers are jonesing for any kind of information we can share with them. So, uh, again, with that, obviously pay attention here. Sherelle, Sean, Ben, whomever will be all over that uh, as information breaks around any specific target, much less uh, Harrison Ingram. Um, Sherelle, do you want to take that chance to to reset the portal situation? Yeah. So, uh, again, we're going to get into it later with the uh, open evaluation period starting this weekend. So that kind of changes, the, I, I guess, the math on uh, official visits. So you, a lot of school the shopping either. list anyway, right? Like the shopping yeah, list yeah. is different. Yeah. Right, right. So there's that. And then also because the coaching staffs will be on the road seeing high school players, their, you know, commits, their signees and all that good stuff. A lot of schools won't host official visits that next weekend because they want to be out on the road. I know Carolina in the past, what they've done, uh, Justin Pierce is a good example. They've waited until the Sunday of uh, that evaluation period and started the visit like that Sunday evening. So Justin Pierce came in. I think uh, on a Sunday around four or five o'clock and Roy Williams and his staff, you know, were I was with them in Atlanta watching the, who they were watching uh, during AAU. They left about 12 o'clock, flew back up and started the visit. So it could be a situation where something like that happens. But um, as far as the rest of it is concerned, obviously they had to end home with Harrison Ingram. We're still monitoring uh, people like Dalton Connect. Um, there was a note about uh, another ACC player who they have reached out to, and, and we think there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that's been to uh, told. You can read that um, in the offseason scoop we posted on Friday. Uh, obviously, Jalen Withers is committed. I believe he actually is on an official visit to UNC today, either today or tomorrow. 
um, even though he's already committed. And then uh, Paxton Wojcik obviously is committed. Uh, and then there's, uh, I would say, a few other players that they have shown some interest in, uh, but we just we don't have the detail of, of how interested they are. And obviously they're going to continue with the monitor the portal, which does not close until May 12th. Uh, and then 19 days after that, players who have entered the NBA drafts and maintain their eligibility, that's when they have to be out of the NBA draft to maintain their college eligibility. So that's May 31st. So again, the key dates to look for are May 12th when the portal closes and May 31st when the guys who have entered the draft uh, have to withdraw. So much time between now and then. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you two questions. First off, if if someone was kind of putting you in a bind and saying, hey, give me one thing that UNC needs, if they get one thing out of the portal right now uh, that you can guarantee they will have by the time this process is over, what is that one thing? I got two questions. That's the first one. Shooting. I mean, they, they got that with, with Withers. I think in an ideal scenario, you're getting – shooting and a slasher and i think that's what everybody was was hoping for but i i think if they're able to wrangle in one very strong prospect um you know to go with to go with withers you're, you're definitely not giving it a a plus in the portal but still when you're when you're bringing back rj and armando that at least starts to put a, a strong core around them uh, i think what we're we're seeing as of right now, as Phil said, there's still time, so there still could be names, but maybe not, not seen as strong of a transfer portal as just in, in general we thought. And UNC moved really quick using Timberlake as an example, but you have so many other schools, big name schools, you know, we're just right now with, with Kansas, et cetera, pretty much everybody's trying to reload and, and use the portal. So Every decent player is going to have extreme competition for that. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you you look at the list of names in terms, sure, there, there's some that jump out at you and there's some that are going to, whose stats aren't going to jump at you that are going to, you know, turn into, you know, the Jake Laravias, et cetera, of the world. But I think shooting, they, they still need that to to pair, um, you know, with what they what they have and, in an ideal world, world they have an athletic slasher that can that can uh, be feared from from behind the three point line. But as of right now, if they can get one one of those, I'd be happy. All right, that's one question. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, I was just gonna add. For, I forgot uh, Nick Timberlake. Uh, so he again visited UNC a couple of weeks ago. He's also taken an official visit to Kansas, and then he was on an official visit to UConn this past weekend. Uh, some reports are saying that he likely won't take any more visits. Uh, so it seems to be Kansas, UNC, or uh, UConn for Timberlake. I mean... And, it, and no it, idea it, what, it was a, what, a, what his announced date might be, Cheryl? Uh, no, I don't think there's been a public announcement okay. of a potential date. Go ahead, Sean. I was going to say, I mean, if you're Timberlake, and especially with the scouting video that, that we shared with on IC uh, a few weeks ago, and you saw a lot of the plays that Towson ran to get him open, uh, I mean, it, most likely it's three to five minutes of, of watching UConn's off-ball movement. I was gonna, that's and what, that's and some Danny Hurley like. stuff if I've ever seen it, man. Hey, you, Gosh. Just, you just go to him and say, hey, look at Jordan Hawkins, and here you go. Um, <laughs> yep. And, you know, again, he's he's a player, to your point, Sean. Unless he uh, wants out of the, the Northeast and, and wants something else, but you, show, you showed two minutes of that, and that should seem right. ideal. And, and to your point, Sean, I think people have to realize it is a, a smaller pool. Uh, even though there's a ton of players, I think – you kind of see who the elite schools have focused on and they're all going after the same player. So like at one point it was interesting because Carolina was like, Oh, you know, Nick Timberlake will make a great ninth man on a yeah. good roster. And it's like the kids being recruited by Indiana and Kansas and UCLA and Yukon, like he's not going somewhere to be the ninth man. Um, so I think that should inform a little bit about what's out there and, and what UNC is trying to accomplish. Uh, but again, there's, there's still a lot of time. And I know it doesn't feel like it, but there is still a lot of time. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Again, judge them <clears throat> as harshly as you want once every once all the data is in. Once Father's all the data is in, yeah, if, you, if you feel like they were awful, you know, once the, all the data is in, call them awful. I, I'll, I'll be there with you. But I think you have to allow them the time and not judge while the process is happening. Even, um, so, sorry, just another, even, I mean, looking at Kansas, for instance, they've got a, jumpstart on i mean they have armando and rj 
returning. So I think at least for myself, we'll, we'll need to pay more attention to, to those two um, as the cornerstones of what they can piece together versus being one of these teams that, you know, is looking for even, even more mm-hmm. to, to help with next season. Well, let's continue that discussion. Since you said that, if you look at a lot of the top 10 in the portal, it's, Smaller point guard center, smaller point guard yeah. center, smaller point guard center, combo <laughs> yep. guard center, combo guard center, smaller point guard center, maybe one wing, which is Harrison Ingram. And everybody, <laughs> you know, obviously everybody's after him. So I, it was just weird how it worked out for UNC. But to your point, Sean, that's how I've tried to approach it. You know, this is just me editorializing. I don't 100% know if the staff is approaching it this way, but it feels like they are in that Armando Bacot and RJ Davis are, you know, two you know, impactful players, you know, they're the stars coming back and then you build the roster around them. Like, like I said, it's, it's, it is free agency. So you do whatever you do in the, the final year of their contract to try to make sure that you can make a run and, and do something special. So you try to find guys who complement them well, who are skilled, who also can help elevate them as well. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I, to me, that's what they're doing. Um, and I think that's the way to approach it because, other schools are just trying to get uh, the monsters basically together. Like who are yeah. the five most talented guys in the portal, but Carolina already has two really good players on the roster and they have to fill in around. Them. They got to find their Kyle Kuzma. They got to find their Sean Elliott. They got to find their Eric snow. They got to find those dudes that are obviously not, you know, not all ACC players, but have the ability to deliver all ACC stats on any given night. All right. Yeah, Sean, you, I- you like, you would love to have like, a super talented player for sure who was unselfish who had a high basketball iq who was okay being the number three scorer who played defense but do those people really exist who well, are okay but with they, all that? they may also be waiting to see how their nba fortunes pan out right that's the other right. thing to consider a lot of these guys may still be trying to see what kind of feedback they can get from from nba camps so right. sean asked you the first of two questions the first one was about what do you think north carolina needs uh out of if they have to get one thing out of this transfer portal uh, window, what is it? The second question I'll ask you is if you have to get one thing from Johnny T-shirt right now, what is it? I'm going with some uh, probably six month and up baby baby clothes. Onesies. All right. We'll see. It's If you say that, you're in luck because Johnny T-shirt has such things. And matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they've got like good branded stuff. Um, Nike stuff. Uh, all You can get white with UNC lettering. You can get uh, Carolina blue with 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 white lettering. You can even get like the third color onesie, right? And get the navy. <laughs> Don't get the black onesie because then the the football premium message boards will be set ablaze. Because God forbid you have a, a kid wearing a black onesie with UNC logo on it. But the point is, Johnny T shirt has all that stuff. Go to Johnny T shirt dot com right now. Inside Carolina premium members know that you get an extra ten percent off. Use the code that's found on the premium message boards, or if you happen to be in town like yesterday when everybody seemed to be in Chapel Hill for some kind of sport because there were sports for everybody, Gadzooks, you could have stopped by Johnny T-shirt on East Franklin Street there and done your shopping yourself. Either way, we appreciate their support of Inside Carolina. Uh, we just appreciate their support of the use of the word Gadzooks. We'll be right back after this break to let the national guys run some ads, and we'll, we'll wrap up and talk a little bit about the live period this coming weekend here on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. All right, welcome back. Thanks for sticking around for last part of this episode of the Coast to Coast Podcast. I'm Joey Powell, your host. Sean Moran and Cheryl McMillan are with me as always. Guys, live period starts this weekend. The first, uh, as Cheryl mentioned so eloquently earlier, uh, non-scholastic basketball live period this weekend. I love all the adjectives. Um, Cheryl, I want to ask you, first off, you're headed down to the ATL uh, to not see a Braves game, which is unfortunate, but to to catch some uh, some EYBL action, uh, I want to ask you: Who are you expecting to see on your trip down there? Uh, yeah, so I, I want to start before I tell you exactly who we're going to see there. It's interesting because normally this is like a really exciting time of year. Like it, it's it's big. It's EYBL. It's the next class of uh, guys who be seniors next year. Their last turn on EYBL and their chance to kind of raise the ranking and raise their profile and, and all that good stuff. Last year at this time, we were watching Gigi Jackson and, and Zayden High, uh, among others. Simeon Wilcher, you know, had a great first game and got hurt. This year, I don't know, it's just there's not the same excitement around it because I feel like the transfer portal has just taken over. Like it is the the thing that's dominating the sport right now. And it used to be that uh, the first live period was kind of 
you know, that represented moving on from the championship game, but you never really even got to move on from the championship game because the portal opens the day after the selection show. So really the tournament has been kind of one a and the transfer portal has been one B for almost a month. Um, so it kind of, it shortens the runway for EYBL and for Adidas and for UAA uh, with the, these grassroots events. So I, I just find that interesting how, <clears throat> again, over time, uh, things have changed. Last year, uh, they changed the schedule as well because for the transfer portal. Last year, the live period started four days after the national championship game. So same weekend as the Masters, Hubert Davis and his staff, you know, have a tough tough loss against Kansas. And three days later, they're in Orlando scouting guys. So uh, a different schedule this year. Uh, we expect them to be in Atlanta for EYBL, but also um, to be out for Adidas and UAA uh, because both uh, both circuits have talent outside of EYBL, especially Adidas for UNC. Ian Jackson plays on the Adidas circuit, so they're going to have to spend a considerable amount of time on that circuit, which is more than they've done, you know, the last few years. As far as who's there for UNC, uh, we'll have a full breakdown later in the week, but uh, uh, Elliot Cadeau plays for uh, New Heights Lightning in EYBL. Uh, James Brown switched this year. So he's with Mocan Elite, which is traditionally one of the better programs uh, in EYBL. Drake Powell uh, plays for CP3. Again, another traditionally really you know, good, rich program um, that has done well with North Carolina players. So those are kind of the, the top three, I would say, that we're looking at. Um, after that, Jaron Stevenson plays for Team United. And unfortunately, on Friday night, I think all four of those guys play at the same time on different courts. So it'll be uh, fun to see and, and uh, you know, see who the coaching staff is watching during that time. And then it also will afford us to see kind of who, uh, you know, potential new targets are in 2024 and in 2025. I should mention as well, uh, while I'm on this soliloquy, that uh, uh, Isaiah Harwell, who is the only player in 2025 to have a UNC offer also plays on Adidas. So another reason they're going to have to spend more time uh, there than they have in the past. Well, I, if nothing else, I need you to get me some uh, Knight Riders elite gear <laughs> um, because you know, my affinity for awesome names in the circuit. Yes. And that's probably my favorite team name on the EYBL circuit right now. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you, what are, what do you want to see or what are you hoping to see uh, this coming weekend, uh, you know, Sherelle's kind of given us the insight as to who I see expects to watch and, and who he thinks UNC might be watching. But what are you as an analyst and somebody who's a vital member of this show? What do you want to see come out of this coming weekend, whether it be at the, the UAA or the 3SSB or the EYBL events? So, uh, you know, as Sherelle mentioned with the first live period, there's there, there's always going to be a lot. And, and usually that that sets up the stage for the second period in terms of maybe new, new offers that, that come, but really the number one thing for me is going to be Drake Powell. Uh, last year was able to see him in Kansas city, EYBL. Then he, he, he went to peach jam, uh, and during the high school season transformed from that four star that signed with UNC to a now, now five star. I think when watching his high school games, you saw some guy that just from a size athletic standpoint, um, significantly stood out from the crowd. Uh, he he looked like he had improved his shot, was more aggressive. The guy I saw in Kansas City was a guy that, um, you know, blended in. Uh, was more than happy to be very pass first, uh, deferential. Um, you know, rarely looked for his shot when out without being extremely wide open. So, kind of seeing this progression in in high school. Not that I'm expecting him to be scoring twenty twenty five points, but. Definitely want to see how he fares now at this highest level. Uh, is he able to kind of show out that he is this this five star guy and show what he did in high school, or you know, is he does he kind of blend into the the CP three team that he played with last year? I think uh, once again, I don't see him being that twenty five point scorer, but I I am expecting him to showcase um, that ability we all saw this year and and the fact that he has significantly improved and has a really high ceiling. Uh, so I'd say that, that that's really the primary focus. And then there's some smaller ones, Jaron Stevenson, how much attention are they paying to him? How does he look after uh, playing pretty, uh, I'd say kind of, uh, I'll say a smaller high school, <laughs> high school class in terms of competition. And then from a 2025 perspective, as real noted that there's only one offer right now. 
Uh, I expect there to be several other 2025s coming from maybe not the first or second weekend, but pretty quickly. So those are just a few of them. But really, for me, it's it's Drake Drake Powell is the primary thing to to look out for. I, I would add too uh, another thing I'm looking at, or a couple of things I'm looking at. Uh, we obviously know that Elliot Cadeau has said that he has a decision to make as far as which class he enters um, UNC, whether it's 2023 or 2024. And we know that um, Boogie has an offer uh, from UNC in 2024. However, again, the competition for him is going to be fierce. So UNC kind of has to do some contingencies on 2024 lead guards, I would say, because if Godot does come in, in 2023 um, and, and, you know, you can't beat out Kentucky and UConn and a few others for Boogie, then you're going to need a, a point guard in 2024. So will they... How much attention will they pay to, to point guards in 2024? Um, you know, Drake Powell plays with Bishop Boswell, uh, a North Carolina player, um, goes to Myers Park High School in Charlotte, potentially. Maybe he's someone they, they're going to see a lot and, and someone they like and, and monitor more during the summer. And then the other thing is, obviously, Jaron Stevenson, uh, most people thought at this point he would already be a UNC commit, frankly, and he's not. And he's taken official visits to Virginia. And I think probably within the last month for the first time, I think everybody's like, well, this is not a 100% or 75% or 60% done deal. Like a lot of folks um, had assumed or had been told for such a long time. So that being said, UNC signed, it's a very important position, but since Hubert Davis has been the head coach, they've only been able to sign one hybrid for it. And that's Zayden High. Uh, you know, they lost another one and the other four have all come from the portal. So will they look at a, a hybrid forward in 2024 um, that's playing someone who we don't know yet or someone who has a great weekend or a great couple of weekends? Because, again, at this point last year, we had no idea who uh, – I think on, on the scorecard it said Michael High Jr. We are like, who is Michael High Jr.? And that was Zayden High. And eventually he became a, a UNC signee. So uh, 2024 league guard, just – all the different variables that can happen because of what Cadeau does or doesn't do. And then um, will they kind of start to move, not move away from Jaron Stevenson, but look for help at, at that position because he's been really the only target for, you know, over a year. Yeah. That's a great way to end the show. I think fellas, I appreciate the, the, the nice wrap. I think our listeners will really like uh, understanding if they pay attention to these sorts of events, this is what uh, you can expect to read about in the coming days and weeks on InsideCarolina.com. Uh, fellas, I'm thankful for you as always. Uh, appreciate what you bring to the show. Appreciate, I know you're both working like nobody's business right now behind the scenes. And that's something that uh, if our subscribers don't recognize that, I hope you hear me saying it. Uh, these dudes are absolutely glued to, um, in Sean's case, you know, a tape and a, and a notepad in Shrill's case, uh, the old text messages there. Um, mm -hmm. Fellas, I appreciate you. Want to give a big shout out to Shrill and Sean. Big shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring and also to John Siegley for producing and making all this sound as smooth as uh, as a baby's behind. So until next week, we will be right back on the Coast to Coast podcast as things break. If things break this week, uh, be sure to check out InsideCarolina.com for all your news, which we know you will. And if you haven't, drop us a review. We like to hear from uh, from our listeners and find out if we're doing well or, or if there are things we need to improve upon. Because if there are things we need to improve upon, well, we want to fix them. But until next time, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, who, who's viewing us on the YouTubes, and we will catch you down the road on the Coast to Coast podcast from InsideCarolina.com.